Pastor Stacy, our church allows South Campus Pastor, my wife Heidi and I have the privilege of leading the amazing campus that's reaching Andrew and below. We're willing to reach people in Fayetteville. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Done everywhere now. So it's great to be here this morning as Pastor Glenn and Laura are refreshed and with ministry and, and family things going on. So uh, we'll see them soon enough. Uh, right now, the South Campus is in the thick of it. My heart's with them. I'm like, I hope it's all going well. And I'm sure it is. It's a great ministry team there. And uh, we also have our 10 a.m. gathering at the same time as this one there. 8.30 gathering was loud. 8.30 gathering shouted me down. So where are you at, 10 a.m.? Oh, man. Somebody, call, somebody post 8.30 a.m. already lost. Somebody post it right now. It's so good to see you guys. I love you guys. Um, Worship with you again. As Heidi and I serve on our overall campus um, and things like that, helping oversee the overall mission and vision of Church Alive, it's an honor to, to guide the South Campus through, the, through all the thick and the thin. So we love you. Um, we are going to continue our altars series. Have you enjoyed the altars series? Has it been refreshing? Have any, does anybody have any epiphanies, any aha moments, any clarity brought to you about how to approach the Lord how to do business, how to get down to business at the feet of God, how to encounter his presence in an intentional way, in a biblical way, and be able to leave that and go do life. Yep, yep. Everybody love this series. This is actually your last Sunday for our altar series. So the last one, it's been a joy to preach. It's been a joy to uh, watch even here. Again, our main campus gathering, the videos are always featured every week on our YouTube page and our Vimeo page, and it has been a joy to preach this message, um, especially last weekend on worship. Come on, somebody. Remember last week looking at the tabernacle and the flow of worship, how, how even today, you may not have realized it, but even today as we've had this experience, already you've already went through layers and layers of what the tabernacle of God is. We're actually doing those things biblically and tangibly, even here in 2017 here on Umstead Road. And so hoping you take that again, check out every author series video, catch up to the whole thing. But today we're landing and today's message is called decisions. Say decisions. See, you had to make a split second decision whether or not you were going to say decisions after I asked you to. See, everything is a decision. And so before we jump into a lot of it, I want you to, to know that before anything, because we're all in different types of seasons of life, and it is important that you know that you know that God's heart, God's heart is so close to your decisions this morning. God is not far away from your decisions. Whatever, whatever thing you're facing right now, whether it's an everyday tangible or whether it is like I like to call a cinematic moment that's a fork in the road that will cause a domino effect on everything, wherever you are today, God is close to your decisions. His heart he genuinely cares. And because of that, I pray to preach a message today. We pray to have an atmosphere today that actually leans into that, that you know the decisions you make in life are valuable. They're crucial in the kingdom of God. It, it has a place. It has a high rank in the kingdom of God. God cares so much about your decisions. He made the ultimate decision to send his son for us so that we could have an opportunity to decide to follow him. I mean, that's a decision, is it not? Everything is a decision. I love the old song, I have decided to follow Jesus. No what? No turning back. Man, some of y'all wasn't raised in it. No turning back. No turning back. So my responsibility today is for you to hopefully feel by the, the presence of God, the truth of the word of God, that God cares about your decision. He's no respect your persons. Your, de your decisions are valuable, no matter your rank. And so here's the landing point. Destiny is determined by each decision. Every decision we make, if you believe that life is a sum of all of our days, right? That's what life is. It's a sum of all of our days. This year, 2017, is coming to a close. Can you believe it will be November this week? It should be, I mean, young people are like, I don't even know what year it is, man. I'm going to live forever. <laughs> But I recently hit the 4-0 mark, and, uh, you know, this year. And so it's amazing that it's already, this year is already almost over. 40 is the new 20. Isn't that what Pastor Glenn always says? <laughs> hey, here before long, he's going to be like, 50 is the new 15. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Delete that part. <laughs> 
But every day determines our destinies, all these decisions. Recently at a ministry conference, my wife and I were at, along with Pastor Glenn and Laura also, a pastor there that was preaching, he's actually um, kind of an up-and-coming leader, we believe really on behalf of the whole church, connected with people like Gary Smalley and different pastors that are really like your, your James Dobson's that are really like psychologists for the family, but they're also Christians as well, very educated, their academia all the way combined with the Bible. And he said something at this about decisions that just stopped me in my tracks. I love thoughts. I love phrases. I love phraseology that just hits you, hits you right, right, right down deep. So here's the thought he submitted to us. Among psychologists, they would submit to all of us today that most decisions have already been made. Think about that. Most decisions have already been made. Circumstances simply reveal what we've already decided. That is sobering. Now, my old pastor I grew up with, it feels like he was in his 80s when I was a kid, but he's still alive. He must be like 120. I love him. I grew up under his covering. He really is flirting with 100 now. He's a great man. Amazing. I think a third grade education. That's not everybody in Mississippi. Okay. All right. That was just him. But an incredible thing about him, he would say, he would say this to us young bucks. He would say, you're going to do what you want to do. In other words, he was letting me know, I've already made my mind up. You're going to do what you want to do. And I would submit that to you. Even if you don't realize it, if you take a step back and look at all oh, the good and bad decisions, academia, brilliant minds would submit to us. People that think about this all the time, whereas you and I don't, they would submit to us. You've already decided. So we're going to look at today how God can interrupt and intercede the decisions we've already decided. And he can change those decisions. Amen. He can get us intentionally on a path to make decisions that are according to his truth, according to his spirit. And those things, my friends, are best found at an altar of God, an altar of God. So as we wrap up this series, let's look at these things. Some personal examples. Can I share some just personal examples of decisions to get some traction with you? Some of you, some of you relate to some. Others would be like, I have no idea what he's talking about. But a big decision affects today. It affects even this moment. Um, about 17, 18, yeah, 18 years ago, there was a church that was going to be planted, all right? And there was this room where people were in a room praying and brainstorming about church names, all right? And that list had tons of names. And after a few short weeks of prayers and agonizing and even brainstorms, what, looking back, was very practical, right? Next thing you know, um, that became Church Alive. Like, that's the name of your church, so that was an important decision, right? And Pastor Jimmy alluded to just a moment ago. Like, we already had our mind made up without realizing it. We just knew we wanted a church that was vibrant, loud, and proud, if you can be that biblically, but unapologetic about the gospel of Jesus. Energetic, full of worship. Is that church alive to you? Come on, someone. Is that church alive? So the decision was in us as leaders and Pastor Glenn and Laura guiding at the helm. The decision was in us, right? Now, that was 2000. This thing called seeker sensitive was starting to surface. If you've been in the church world, some of you all were born in 2000. But there was this idea, this creative idea to when we have church, it became a leader of the global, especially the church in America, even amongst Pentecostal churches. This idea of birth, and it was people my age and Pastor Glenn's age, it was our fault, really. This idea of birth of seeker sensitive, meaning when you have church, try to have a gathering where people almost don't realize they were at a church gathering. And then, like, at some point after a few months, you know, maybe they'll come to know the Lord and realize, oh my God, you guys are so cool. I had no idea cool people love Jesus. That's pretty much the concept. Oh, hogwash. I mean, I'm 22, and I'm like, this is baloney. Because I had already decided, Pastor Glenn, Pastor Glenn, other guys with us, this is baloney. So we had already decided, right? So Church Alive is not a church that beats around the bush. Church Alive has already decided to be a church intentional about the message. You say, why in 2000 did you invent the mission statement, Pastor Glenn, be intentional about the message? Actually, the reason that was invented because the move was to be unintentional. But see, now you know the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. I'm, I'm really dating myself. So a personal example was that, being a part of that decision. Heck, I was the first person to leave my street during that season, leaving mama, leaving a road nobody's ever left. My family, my family thinks I might as well be in India as a missionary right now. I'm 750 miles away. In my, 
So that's how they deal with it. That's how they affirm. It was like a little miniature ministry parade. I knew he was going to live for the Lord. Bless God. My grandmothers are still alive. They on Facebook. Hey, man, mom. But, but that was a big decision to leave. I mean, I knew God had plans. I didn't know it would take me this far away, though. You know what I'm saying? So, so those are decisions, and God began to set up those moments, decisions. How did I get that decision? Well, Pastor Glenn brought me here one weekend, um, just kind of hanging out, smelling the air, praying. It was really a moment to pray. Are we going to move here? At this point, he was already committed. Nobody really knew this yet. Come here, visit. He takes me to, like, basketball games. He was trying to sell me on basketball. I love basketball. He's like, here's UNC. Yay. Here, here's NC State. Here's Duke. I was like, don't take me there. I don't want to go. I was like, show me Campbell, somebody. <laughs> Didn't even know. It existed. I'm sorry. I know Campbell is for real now. I, that's where I'm ministering at. I go camels. So <laughs> point is, when I got back home, I'm like, I kind of had already decided to do this. But when I get back home, there was this God moment, this incredible supernatural moment that we're going to look at. Seems practical, but things that are pra practical to others may be supernatural to you. Are you with me? So I get home. This is before emails. This is too I get home, and I have a, a letter in the mail. Have you ever had a letter, young people, in the mail? It's awesome. <laughs> it's like written in cursive by a redneck guy I know. But I could read it. He had a higher than a third grade education. And in that case was a tape. Everybody ever had a tape before? Like a cassette tape. And he had recorded music on his eight, well, you know, I say eight track and everybody got excited. I'm not talking about the eight track in the car. <laughs> I'm talking about the, what you record music on, all right? Last church got excited. Eight track, oh yeah. I say, not that eight track. I am not that guy. I've never seen it. All right, so I get home and I open it up. And it's a letter. Oh, you're a songwriter. I've always loved writing songs. He's like, man, I just, I know you're, I, don't, I haven't talked to you in months, maybe years, but I felt led to send you a song and ask you what you think about it. I'm trying to write songs. And I opened the title, and the title is Now or Never. And knowing this guy and knowing how much, he's such a man's man, knowing how much it took for him to send anything poetic, much less to a dude, <laughs> That used to make sense. It's 2017. I hope it always makes sense. Come on, somebody. But I'm like holding this letter in front of a $350 townhome that's nice, and I'm complaining about it. Y'all remember getting ripped off and it was $350? I wish I could go back. And I'm weeping. God, thank you for speaking. It's like a cinematic moment. Now or never, I read these words. It doesn't even matter how good the song was. It was an encounter with God. That moment is an altar. Like I literally, like even last service, like right now I could, I could cry if I paused. Like it's so broken. Does anybody have those type of memories if you go to? And I'm not talking about even uh, sorrowful memories. I'm talking about pivotal memories, okay? This is what God wants to do in your life through altars. How many of you want to have those types of moments? You've got them. This room is full of them. If we pass the mic around, we'd be here all day. So get the word out at small groups and everything you're doing. Not everybody's going to be on a platform. Not everybody's going to preach the same way. But share these stories. Amen. One of the biggest is nine years old. Holy Ghost, fill me. Having an encounter with, with the Holy Ghost and fire in the cl church culture I was raised in. It, it totally shaped not only my life, but the life of other young people that I was around. Those prophetic things, those supernatural encounters just on an average Sunday night service. Just another day, but a supernatural encounter. So with all that... With all that, I want to go into really some of the other nuggets about a decision. We're going to look at the life of Jacob here shortly. And we're going to look at how his life unfolded with decisions and things like that. But a couple of more nuggets before we do that. Your destiny. Destiny is not a mystery to God. Your destiny is not a mystery to God. We see through a glass that's dim. We're not supposed to see it all right now. We long for a good destiny. We long for a life that matters. We long for a life of peace, right? But we cannot even see our destiny, but our destiny is not a mystery to God. So if you trust God, you're by default at peace with your destiny. If you're in chaos about your destiny, take a step back. Instead of making about destiny, say, I'm not at peace with God right now. 
That's how you measure your destiny, where you are with God and the peace you have. Down deep, the kind of stuff nobody else can touch but you. Deep, that deep peace. We are responsible to steward every day. Again, every day leads to destiny. Our destiny, God has a perfect plan for us, but we are responsible to steward our destiny. Is anybody living or doing or has ever, th- ever had a, a, a season of your life where you were living a life you weren't supposed to live? Yes. In fact, we were talking biblically as uh, Pastor Steve, I mean, I'm sorry, Pastor Scott and I met and Pastor Glenn about this sermon. Pastor Scott's at South Campus preaching today. We talked about how when people debate over, uh, over destiny and God's perfect will, is everything predestined and all that kind of stuff you can analyze. At the end of the day, we were all born into sin, right? But that was not God's perfect will. So the first time we breathe, we're breathing under a capacity of God's perfect destiny for our life. We're already having to make a climb. So you can live below your destiny. We need to understand that. Even as children of God, we have a responsibility. And here's some of those nuggets that go with that. Indecision is a decision. Now, I might be preaching to the choir out here, but it's the kind of choir that don't know how to sing in key sometimes. Indecision is a decision. Okay? So some thoughts. I was reflecting on, on other stories about my life, just kind of a, a quick, easy, tangible story. One time when I was early in college, and I hope my son isn't listening, but I was in college, and he perked up. I was driving to somewhere I didn't need to go, a place around people I don't need to be around. I'm driving there, and I'm in a pivotal season where God's shaping some things, and I know better, but I'm like, man, you know, I, I just know it's not right, and I'm headed there. Anybody ever been on that road? I'm headed there, and I had had, you know, I was in a crazy car accident as a child where nobody was hurt, and it was a miracle. So I was kind of aware of accidents and how they can happen, and usually you can connect the dots. But somehow, I mean, there was no such thing as texting and driving. There was nothing. Somehow, my tire is simply hit the road. It was not even, I promise you, nothing crazy teenage driving. Next thing I know, I'm in a road, and I'm spinning out of control in the middle of the road. I promise you, I did a 360, whatever it would be in uh, X Games. I did a 360, and when I stopped turning, I stopped in the middle of the road, never went off the road, and I was facing where I had came from. Now, thank goodness I had had some altars in my life, and I'm always anticipating. I want to be a person, and you can want to be a person that's always anticipating the things and the practical. What is God supernaturally saying? Well, guess what? I went back from where I came from, and I didn't go where I was going. And I know some people that went where I was going, and let's just say there's been a handful of legal relationships, and there's been a couple of those guys that are stewardesses all over the world, if anybody knows. (laughs) Like, basically, you're a young man, and you're going somewhere you don't need to go. And their lives, I can see, are in chaos. There's nothing wrong with being a stewardess. I lost you for a second. But it was crazy, basically a party crowd, and they just kept going further and further, and their lives are just all over the map. Y'all following me? But God turned me around to the path, and that is a part of the altar. So Jacob has a life a lot like that. So as we look at Jacob, Jacob had a life where indecision had become a decision to him. He also had a life, he had a life that, that he was going to learn about later on that Delayed obedience is actually disobedience. Okay, delayed obedience is a part of the disobedience also. So Jacob, Jacob, to set him up, Jacob is a fugitive. All right, Jacob is on the run. He is running for his life from his brother who he stole all the riches from. He has stole the promise from his older brother. And Jacob is a liar. He's on the run. He's running for his life. At the same time, At the same time, in an incredible way, Jacob is also highly blessed and favored. In fact, to break it down to the here and now, in Jacob's known world, in his here and now, which is all that really matters, Jacob would have been the guy who was set up to become the richest, wealthiest, most powerful person in the community he's from. This is Jacob's destiny. This is who Jacob was going to be. So why is Jacob on the run if he knows that's his destiny? Well, because Jacob obviously had made some decisions that were not pure in the Lord. And you reap that sowing, right? 
But check this out. Jacob, which means deceiver and liar, here's what's incredible about this. Jacob, even in this situation, he had complete faith. He completely, there was not one doubt. Remember I talked about you've already decided what you believe? There was not one doubt in Jacob's mind or headspace. He completely believed that he was going to inherit the land. He believed he was going to inherit. Was just, at this point, he's just, how is this going to happen? This doesn't look good, right? If you ever had something you know God's going to let unfold, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen. Well, here's how much Jacob believed. This is how much Jacob believed God in kind of a head case way. Jacob believed in God's promises so much that he lied to get it. How many of you know when you start lying, you're lying to get something you believe in usually? That's the irony about a lie. You usually lie to get what you mostly believe is true. Jacob is lying to his own father to get what he believes in. This is how much he's convinced. But right now, he's on the run. He's an outcast. He's all alone. And Jacob is actually leaving somewhere in a home and his mother in the, in the opportunity and the access to riches that were to come. He's leaving all that and having to go places he doesn't want to go. He's being sent to his crazy uncle's house. He's being sent away, and he's on his way there. So he's in a place with a great destiny, but in, be- in between where he's from and where he wants to go. Who can relate? <laughs> Genesis chapter 28. We're going to read all about Jacob in this moment where he's on this road. Open up Genesis chapter 28 with me. We're going to read 12 verses. That's a lot of verses. Are you all with me? We're going to read them, follow along. Incredible. I'll stop a little as we go. Jacob left Beersheba, and he set out for Haran. So again, make a note here. This is somewhere Jacob does not want to go. Jacob is on deck to be the man, and he's having to go somewhere he doesn't want to go. When Jacob reached a certain place, Jacob stopped for the night because the sun had set. That can seem like just a drive-by moment, just a meaningless little verse. But for the sake of today, that's one of the biggest verses of this passage. J- Jacob stopped for the night because the sun had set. This is where it gets practical. A practical moment. The sun is gone. It's nighttime. He's on the run. He needs to keep moving. But the practicality hits. It's time to rest. It's time to go to bed. So what would seem like just an insignificant everyday moment, Jacob in this everyday practical moment is about to have the greatest moment of his life. So it's a practical decision. And then Jacob takes one stone, just a stone there, and he put it under his head and laid down to sleep. And while he was sleeping on a stone in a practical place, Running for his life, Jacob had a dream. God began to speak to him in an incredible way. This is where God, for the first time in Jacob's life, God supernaturally took over his practical life. See, Jacob's always willing and dealing. Jacob's always like, I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to cut corners. I got to make this happen, right? I got to, I got to, I'm going to go, I got to, I got to get it done. But here's the irony with Jacob, with all his hustling and bustling, with everything, all his, all his ingenuity. There's ingenuity, ing, people here full of ingenuity. And even apart from all that, all his creativity, God speaks to him in the most powerful way when Jacob is still practical and it ain't even his credit. Isn't that incredible? He's laying down sleeping on a rock. I mean, that's bad, y'all. His head is on a rock sleeping, and he has the greatest moment of his life in which he saw a stairway. We'll use ladder terminology today, say ladder. A stairway, a ladder resting on the earth and with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And there above it, there above it stood the Lord. He saw the Lord, and the Lord said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. This is important. This is all Jacob knows. And again, Jacob believes in it so much. 
He's willing to lie and be a fugitive to get it. I am the God of your father, Abraham. That's his grandfather. I'm the God of your father. Jacob perhaps respects no one more than Abraham. There's no one more he idolizes, wants to copy and be, be like. But I am the God of your father, Abraham. And then the Lord continues to speak. I am also the God of Isaac, which is Jacob's dad. I'm the God of Isaac. I'm the God of the man who you just tricked into getting this blessing. I saw everything you did, Jacob. You can't get anything by me. I see you. But in this moment, with his head on a rock in the middle of nowhere, running for his life, Jacob, for the first time, encounters God for himself. And God goes, let me introduce you to me. Now, God's done that in many of your lives. If not today, God, God wants to be the God of you, not of Church Alive or your father or a Christian inheritance. God wants to be the God of you. He does. He longs to be the God of you. We can't live off the remnants of those that have gone before us only. God wants to be the God of us. And so Jacob is hearing that, and God says, I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. So God's first words to Jacob aren't even a rebuke. You liar, you. I can't believe you tricked the, your dad, and I'm the God of him. What are you thinking, Jacob? You deserve to be out here. No, God, as a father, began to speak to the destiny of Jacob. So Jacob is sleeping and listening prophetically. I will give you the land of your sentence on which you are lying. I mean, he's in the middle of nowhere. Did you catch that? He's in the middle of nowhere. And God's like, you happen to be laying somewhere I'm going to give you also. And you didn't even mean to be here. That's how much God is affirming his life. Your descendants will be like the dust. You're going to have some kids, Jacob. They will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and the east, to the north and the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. The rock he laid his head down, his name even became Israel through this process. The nation, God, God's, God's nation, his people, Israel, all came from Jacob. His name was later changed to Israel. And God says, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I've done what I've promised. This land in that context, God is telling Jacob, I'm going to bring you back to where you want to be. I'm going to bring you back to where you're going to be. I'm a God of restoration, and I won't leave you. So Jacob, this is his first ever time to encounter God himself. He's been around the church. He's been in a, maybe a community where, where church is accepted. He's around the things, and maybe he's even willing. You know, may, Jacob, might he would have been like a local banker. Kind of, there's... I'm not calling, but there's definitely local bankers on earth or any other thing that they're members of church to really reap the rewards of being like a decent citizen. I'm just telling you, that's how life is. Jacob was a guy like that. He wasn't like serving in ministry for ministry. He wasn't trying to be an influence for Jesus for the sake of the cross. G Jacob had only taken the benefits of the culture of God, but he had never taken ownership himself. So Jacob is now, he's so moved by this. Jacob wakes up, he's a new man, just like we can wake up from an altar and be a new man. Jacob wakes up and he says, surely the Lord is in this place. And we worked hard here as a church to prepare, even at our South Campus, lots of setup. All Jacob had was dirt and a rock. And he got his worship on. Lord, you're in this place, God. I've never had such an anointed rock in my life. I mean, I don't know what he was saying. But Lord, you're in this place. How much more can we say? Man, if you didn't sense God's presence during worship early today, come on, somebody. God is in this place, and he's everywhere you take him with you. Jacob goes, I was not aware of it, and he was afraid, and he just began to praise God. How awesome is this place. There's none other like this in the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And then he took the stone the next morning, and he set it up as an altar. He poured oil on it. And he set up that, that monumental place, if you will, that he could always go back to Bethel, the place of God, the house of God. Isn't that incredible? That's who Jacob was, and this is who Jacob is becoming. 
And from there, we can read on the word how Jacob unfolded, how his life, how there was restoration, how his destiny. So, so Jacob, in his practical moment, God actually gave him something practical to make an altar out of. You don't have to be over-creative to encounter the presence of God. Just be available. Be available because God's destiny is for you to know him. Listen, be alert. Some of you, it may mean you need to run from what you're in. You need to get away. Got to see that. Maybe you got a good family, but they're just, oh, man, they're just giving you so much advice. Like, I can't even hear God. Say, family, this is good. I love you. That would be a good problem if my kids do that to me one day. That would be an awesome situation. Dad, man, you, oh, I'm for you, Dad, but can I just, I need to figure that would be a great thing. That means they're growing. But you may need to just communicate that as a young man and woman of God. Just give me a second here. And God wants to meet you. He wants to be your God. He wants you to make your altars. We share this altar as a church, but we need to make our individual altars, and those require decisions. And decisions are not ever intended to be easy. I mean, a good decision may be one of the hardest decisions you've ever made. I mean, we think about decisions. We've we got to have dreams. We have to have decisions, and then all of this will unfold into blessing. Worship team, you can begin to play. We have an opportunity with an altar of God to, to recognize that a dream births the desire for destiny. God's dreams birth the desire for his purpose, for his destiny. Even if God's already spoken to you some things that will come or encourage you, man, I can see you going toward this. Maybe it's a career or a trade or, or you know, you've met the one and you're like, man, I'm going to ask her to marry me. I know it's the Lord. Those are destiny. Those are dreams, all right? God will equip you for that, and that dream is what leads to your destiny. God will reveal the path of destiny to dreamers. Be a dreamer. Reflecting back again on the days of Church Alive early on, we couldn't tell a lot of people. It was kind of private because we were working with different churches, and it was approved. We were going to move here and plant Church Alive, but we couldn't tell everybody. There was youth groups that would weep. Oh, they're leaving. You know, you you had to keep it kind of hush. And so... Our code word to each other, all the people that were moving here, we would say to each other, are you dreaming? That was our code word in public when we knew we couldn't talk about it. And we did that for months. Are you dreaming? Hey, you, are you dreaming? Are you dreaming? We can still ask that question. Are you dreaming about the destiny of Church Alive and also the destiny of you and your household? Are you dreaming this morning? It's going to take a decision. And the word decision literally means to cut cut to cut cut away cut it off that can be good things or bad things for me most of the important altered decisions have been things where i had to leave something good at it and isn't that what worship is you bring your best sacrifice but there's also definitely sin struggle activities there's things we definitely need to lay at the altar and cut from also and that's one of the best decisions you can make cut ties. Here's the thing. If I had time to just really preach, man, I'd get louder with this, but to get to God, you're going to have to let go of something. You got to let go of something. If you really want to have that latter type of moment with God, you got to let go of some things. Then you can walk in blessing. Say blessings. Blessings, walking in blessing is crucial to your destiny because walking in blessings isn't for your own benefit. It's for the Everyone around us. Walking in miracles is easy. Guess what? God does that. Miracles are like buzzer beater things from God. Lord, get me out of this, Lord. And those are important. We need miracles. We need supernatural intervention. But God partners with us for blessings, to be stewards. After the miracles, we begin to be faithful, and we walk in blessings. And then something practical, like a letter in the mail, becomes a miracle. Can you believe that? This is what an altered decision leads to. This is what Jacob became after he encountered God himself. Now some of us, especially in the Pentecostal world, I'll speak to this briefly, some of us can chase around signs and wonders, and I love them. Man, I'm raised in it. But some of us, some of us in church culture can be all we're looking for is the ladder. Well, where's the ladder, Lord? Where's that, where's that prophecy, Lord? Where's the ladder? Well, here's the thing about a ladder. 
If you're always looking for a ladder and always looking for some way to climb higher and leave everybody behind, the thing about a ladder, you can't carry a lot with you. And God wants us in a lot of ways to also be blessings, level-headed, wise about the things we affirm, the things we also celebrate, and the way we equip his body. Amen? So ladders, we have our own individually as, as we encounter God. God speaks to us, and then we begin to live a life day to day that leads to the destiny that's from the dream of God. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning where you are? Can you stand with an attitude that I have decided? If you have decided to follow Christ, right now is crucial. Begin to intercede. Begin to stand with an attitude. I've decided. And have faith because guess what? If you were able to decide, there's somebody else in this room that can also decide. God's love is for all of us here today. And today could be an altar for your life this morning. Thinking about the greatest miracle, the greatest blessing, salvation. I want to read Romans chapter 10 real quick. It says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is the Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth, it's with your life, it's with water baptism, it's with all of that. That's how you share, that's how you confess that you've been born again. Amen. Would you bow your heads this morning? Lord, I thank you, God, that you have already individually had incredible moments with so many worshipers here today. This room is full of encounters. I thank you for the altars already symbolic, God. I thank you for the decisions by your believers, God, that have been made but also are going to be made in the days to come. Important, important decisions that not only for themselves but their life around them, God. And right now I pray, God, for the person that hasn't accepted the Lord yet, the person that has doubted or the person that's ran away from God, ran away from the things of God like Jacob. I pray right now that they're convinced of your truth, Lord. In Jesus' name, with every head bowed, would you just raise your hand today, right where you are today. You say, today I want to give my life to Jesus. Today I've been convinced of the miracle, the love of Jesus. Just right where you are, on any given gathering, we have hands. If today is your day of salvation, would you raise your hand right where you are so I can see that. And we're going to pray with you. If today is the day of salvation, amen. Our Lord, I just trust, God, that there is lives, this room is full of lives that are secure in your love, that are secure in your kingdom, God. We love you, Lord, and we thank you, God. We love